This is the best of Capital Insider. That was the week that was with Morris Jones. This week, our political panel breaks down the Ebola threat, controversy in Kentucky, and Florida's Fangate. Plus, singing for the Senate. Several South Dakota senatorial candidates are using their talent to earn a seat in Washington. Will their quirky campaign methods pay off? And later, working with Turkey. The Obama administration is resisting the creation of a no-fly zone inside Syrian territory, turning Turkey's role with the anti-ISIS coalition into a political one. Our defense pro weighs in. But first, here's our own Week That Was debate. Joining me, Jack Berkman, Republican strategist and host of Behind the Curtain with Jack Berkman. Catch him every Saturday night on the Radio America Network and Sunday afternoons at 2 on WMAL in Metro D.C. Also, Richard Fowler, Democratic strategist and host of the nationally syndicated Richard Fowler Show. Download his podcast at FowlerShow.com. The Ebola scare continues with news of a second health care worker testing positive. A second health care worker at Texas Health Presbyterian Hospital has preliminarily tested positive for Ebola. Now a third health care worker is being held in isolation on a cruise ship in Belize. The Obama administration also announced it will appoint Ron Klain as the new Ebola czar. Jack, are health officials and government leaders doing enough to stop this deadly virus? Oh, Morris, not even close. Now we have Ron Klain, who's essentially a political hack, who knows less about infectious disease than I do, going to be a czar. It's just another excuse to grow out the federal bureaucracy. That's all this is. I think that's all Obama and the Democrats have their minds on. Look, I still don't understand the basics. I don't know why flights from West Africa were not sealed off. Yes, I know the argument they're going to they're going to originate in Liberia, go through Paris, go through London. But if a passenger is originating in those affected countries, that passenger, whether he has symptoms or not, should never be landing in the United States. Yeah, we'll Obama should have done second. that a long ago. Back to Ron Klain. Richard, do you think this is, he's a political guy, he's supposedly a manager. Do you think they picked the right person? Well, listen, this, this White House, I think this, the, the country, right, they need somebody who can basically take on Ebola 100% of the time, not only, in, not only for the nation, but every state should also have an a, Ebola person, and every is county should yes, have Richard? one, is and every yes, hospital should Klain? have one. What about Klain? Is, is, is Klain oh, the right Oh, I think guy? Klain's the right step until the, you know, the, the, the GOP Congress can get us an attorney, uh, a, a, sec a surgeon general, which they haven't been able to do. Boy, that sounds like a ringing endorsement of Ron Klain. He says, <laughs> I think that's the right step until the Republican Congress can act. Well, that shows you that shows you how much support he has even among Democrats. Look, Ron Klain's a good guy. He's a lawyer. He's a political person. He's some guy like me. Would you want me to be the Ebola czar? I mean, that's a very bad choice, and I think they know that, Morris. God bless him. I wish we still had C. Everett Coop. All right, the fear of Ebola <laughs> has spread much faster than the disease. Some analysts say politics is playing a role in the aggressive response, or maybe lack thereof, like closing the borders. Both sides want to show their strength in handling a crisis. Now, now more lawmakers are calling for travel bans. Richard, are they overreacting? They are overreacting. Now, let's be very, very clear. There is there was only three cases of Ebola in the United States, right? There are 4,000, 5,000 cases happening in West Africa. So our approach has to be multifaceted. First thing we've got to do is we've got to do everything in our power, all the resources we have to make sure we stop the outbreak happening in West Africa. The second thing we have to do is make sure for those folks that are in the United States, we have the best containment policy, we have the best quarantining policy. Now, when you seal off the borders, here Here's what you eliminate, the ability for us to track those individuals. So for example, if we seal off all flights from Liberia, what somebody could do is they can cross the country, uh, across the border into another African country, and then jump on a plane, and then go to Brussels, we'll and then go to all. Paris, then seal go to Hong all. Kong. You seal not, to mention the fact, not to mention the fact, Jack, that we also have a case of Ebola in Spain, so somebody from Spain can come across the border. So I just don't think that sealing our border is the answer. What we need to do is make sure that we're doing the best we can to contain those individuals that have the disease, and make sure that we're educating what the American public Jack, about we can't it. even deal with the border border in Mexico. There's already talk that the enterovirus may have come from there, tuberculosis. Who knows what's coming across the border from Mexico with all these kids that we're, we're putting up and then sending oh, out to yeah. other parts of the country. So you want to see the border with West Africa. I just, Let's worry about Mexico. You can't seal anything around this place. Well, what I don't understand is why is the, why are the, why is the administration and Richard going to such extreme lengths to make sure traffic continues to come from West Africa? I mean, it's is, there not, is this some kind of a race issue? No, it is Obama a race. Kenyan? It's just, it's just a is it that he's a, a Kenyan and likes it's Africa? Non, it's, a it's, a, it's a dumb well, idea. If this Jack. weren't the midterms, Richard, would we be sealing off the borders? No, 
Morris. It sounds like something. Well, let's let's. Everybody wants to see something happen, and it sounds but like a politically what correct. What do we way have to lose? Sealing off the border doesn't do anything. All the experts have said that. So you have folks out there like Michelle, like Marsha Blackburn, who has not a doctor, not a health care professional, barely a congresswoman. Richard, look making at, a, look at wait it this a minute. Way. Wait a minute. Making opinions about if we should seal the border. All the health care professionals in this country are telling us that is not going to solve the You've problem. Got, what else do you want to hear? You've got thousands. You have countries. You have four or are five you a healthcare African professional, countries Jack? I was where there are thousands of people. Are you a healthcare professional? I'm yeah, a, really more, than, healthcare more, more than Ron Klain. If you've got thousands of people, the state of Liberia is being crushed. As a nation state, it is being crushed by this disease. And yet you're out here making a case that somehow traffic from this country could continue. Here's my point. Regardless of the technical debate, what in the world... But that's do we, all that should matter here, Jack. What do we have to lose from sealing traffic from the affected countries? It, it, what, what, what percentage of the U.S. Seal, GDP? This, listen, all the health care professionals, all the infectious disease experts said the same thing. Once we begin to seal off borders from sealing off travel from certain countries, yes. we're unable to track the spread of the disease. Now that the borders are open, we're able to see who is coming from Liberia. We're able to contain them. We're able to it's check their temperatures. Argument. But the moment we seal the borders, it's a ridiculous they're going to cheat the system. I'm not sure all the health care pros are all towing the line with the Obama administration. We've got Baghdad Bob, who's in charge of the CDC. Nothing to see here. Don't worry. Everything's fine. I do, I do admire Anthony Fauci, but I still think a lot of these health care people, they don't know. All right, let's switch gears. As the fear of Ebola is escalating, campaign season is winding down. Election day is less than three weeks away, and politicians are in full campaign mode. But one candidate is getting backlash for her refusal to answer a simple question. In Kentucky, Democratic senatorial candidate Allison Lundigan Grimes declined to say whether or not she voted for Obama as president. Why are you reluctant to give an answer on whether or not you voted for President Obama? Bill, there's no reluctancy. This is a matter of principle. Our Constitution uh, grants uh, here in Kentucky uh, the constitutional right for privacy at the ballot box for a secret ballot. Please. Some are calling it the Todd Aiken moment of 2014. Jack, will Grimes' refusal ensure that Mitch McConnell gets reelected? Oh, of course. I think that this was never a race to begin with. I mean, I, that's a silliness. If she hadn't had some type of famous background, the media wouldn't even be talking about it. I think that's the, uh, this is the all time. I've heard of running away from a president in the same party, but I think this is the all time running away from Obama. Obama finally found a candidate. There is some good news. He was able to campaign with the governor in Connecticut. Did you hear that? Barack Obama finally found a person he can campaign with. I, I think that makes a grand total of one throughout the nation. Grimes should have just pleaded the fifth. <laughs> it might have more of an effect. Richard, why didn't she just say, yes, I voted for Obama, I admire the man, but we now differ on how the country is being led or whatever, and then focus on Kentucky. I agree. I think she should have said I voted for the president and, you know, we just and be, disagree. And be done and, I mean, with it. we disagree on policy. Exactly. I, think, I, I definitely think I agree there, but I think where I disagree with Jackie is on this one. This race is definitely too close to call Morris. And for the fact that the, the people are oh. missing Allison and the Grimes the way they are, they really don't take into consideration the state of Kentucky. The state of Kentucky has lost tons and tons and tons and tons of coal jobs with Mitch McConnell at the watch. Mitch McConnell tries to paint himself as this Washington outsider when he is the opposite. Well, he is the complete opposite. He is the most Washington insider that I and know. And we all know, and we all know who had a lot to do with the loss of those coal jobs. Let me tell you this, how can we be Mitch so McConnell. sure? No, a guy named Barack Obama. Uh, I think how it's can Mitch we McConnell, be so he's the minority sure. leader. He didn't let, stop any of them. Let me ask you this, how can we be so sure that Grimes did indeed vote for Obama? Could it be the case that she didn't vote for Obama and that's why well, she's that's afraid? that's all speculation, Jack, but what the polls tell us that this race is too close to call. Every political analyst, every pollster is telling you the same thing. This race is too close to call, so Jack, I don't I don't know what polls you're reading, but I think you're wrong on this. All right, one of the main issues in this year's midterms is the economy. Unemployment numbers are down, but the stock market is like a roller coaster. Jack, what's your prediction? Will the happenings on Wall Street make it easier for the GOP to take the Senate? Oh, probably. I mean, Obama faces a tough coalition of factors. I mean, he has got the scandals, he's got Ebola, he's got the war in the Middle East going about as bad as it could possibly be going. The one thing that cuts in the president's favor is first the war and then Ebola have enabled him to get 
the scandals off the front page. The IRS thing was ready to go off like an atom bomb. He did, <laughs> he did succeed in pulling Stand a wag. Jack. He succeeded in pulling a wag the dog, and I believe that's what let them, led them into the ISIS war. Right. Bang Benghazi's old news, IRS's old news. So yes, it's what's happening it at the moment, Ebola and the economy. Richard, what do you think? I mean, it was never news to begin with, but let's be real. I think one thing that everybody needs to know is that the president is not on the ballot. This election is about Main Street issues. If you look right here in the state of Virginia, Ed Gillespie, who's supposed to be the quote-unquote savior for the Republican Party. He's going black for the whole week because he's being demolished by Mark Warner. If you look at what's happening in North in, Carolina, in race, wait a minute a now. If you look what's happening in North Carolina, Kay Hagan is up almost four points. Landrew in, 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 in Louisiana, she's up three points. And we could even pick up a seat in South Dakota. There's no question this is going to be an uphill battle for Democrats, but this is about Main Street issues. And the more and more the Republicans make this about Barack Obama, they make a big mistake because well, this I election no, is about six that, years, Richard. not two. I agree with that. Richard is exactly right. I mean, he's exactly right with this. If we're not crushing uh, Kay Hagan in North Carolina, uh, that's a great bellwether. Republicans are not doing nearly as well as I thought they'd do. I'd be the first to admit that. I still think they get to 51, but we, should, we should have been to 54 or 55. All right, place your bets. In the meantime, while several federal campaigns are going on, one state-level race is catching a lot of attention. It all began with the planned debate in Florida between Republican Governor Rick Scott and former Governor Democrat Charlie Crist. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an extremely peculiar situation right now. We have been told that Governor Scott will not be participating in this debate. Now, let me explain what this is all about. Governor Christ has asked to have a fan, a small fan, placed underneath his podium. The rules of the debate that I was shown by the Scott campaign say that there should be no fan. Somehow there is a fan there, and for that reason, ladies and gentlemen, I am being told that Governor Scott really? will not join us for this debate. Governor yeah, Chris, do, do the rules of the debate say that there should be no fan? Not that I'm aware of. So the, the rules that the Scott campaign just showed us that says that no electronics can be used, including Are we really going to debate about a fan, or are we going to talk about education and the environment and the future of our state? I mean, really. All right, so I understand. Now, I thought the fan, you met a groupie. I thought Monica Lewinsky was under the podium. So now it all, it's all clear now. I Richard, actually did, too. <laughs> or, or just a small man. Richard, what do you make of Fangate? And Paul, is politics getting out of hand here? I think politics is getting out of hand. And I think, um, you know, the, the, it's very telling that this go the Florida governor did not show up to this debate or came 20 minutes late. Because he's been 20 minutes late on everything dealing with the issues in the state of Florida. When it comes to education and testing, when it comes to private prisons, when it comes to the Stand Your Ground law, this governor has been behind behind the eight ball, which is why the polls show that Charlie Cruz will have a good election night in two weeks. Uh, Jack, though, I'm, I'm reminded of the, the Nixon-Kennedy debate, where, where Nixon was getting over a cold. He looked so pasty and everything. Kennedy had that natural tan, which turned out to be part of not a, a tan at all, but his medical condition at the time, looking so sallow. But maybe uh, maybe he had something there. You know, if you're going to have a fan to cool somebody off, maybe the other guy needs a fan. What do you think? Oh, I think I agree with you. It's, it's Saturday Night Live instead of the news. I think, I think Scott made it. The governor made a terrible mistake. Mistake. I don't know what he was thinking. I think he lost his cool. I think well, he, he should, couldn't get I think any he, cool. He didn't have a fan. He didn't have his fan. I, I think the analogy I would, I'm kind of with Richard on this. Scott made a terrible mistake. I think the analogy I would use is, uh, is 1965 with Bobby Kennedy debating the chair in the New York Senate race. Remember that one? Yes. I think uh, Chris could have even ad-libbed a little more. He certainly seized upon the moment. He could have done even better. Better than Clint Eastwood talking to a chair. Better yeah, than Clint Eastwood. Definitely that. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, Jack Berkman, Republican strategist. Richard Fowler, Democratic strategist, the best political panel on TV. Thanks to you both. Thank, Thank you, Morris. Thank you, Richard.